In this video, I'm going to talk about afferentation, which means how our brain is receiving sensory input from external sources in order to stabilize our bodies in an upright position and during movement. So afferentation, that simply means when I touch something, like the desk, or I see something, those sensory nerves, or hear something, or feel something between my teeth, or when I feel something underneath my feet, the ground, I'm using those sensory inputs and the changes in those inputs to figure out where my blind brain is in space. It's the sensory input that goes through our appendages, our, our feet and our hands and our, our vision, our teeth, um, probably our diaphragms for breathing, anything that conveys sensory input, sensory information from the external source through the spinal cord and up into our brain where our brain then makes sense of that sensory input to figure out what we're doing, it, uh, where we're going, which direction we're headed, where we're facing, orient, that's called orientation, where, uh, what task we're doing, how much force is needed to accomplish a specific task. All of those things, our brain is using all that sensory input to make output decisions, to make decisions on muscular output. And that's what this video is about. In particular, when we lose proper afferentation, we then begin to rely on over afferentation from one or two areas of our body and our whole overall afferentation system gets thrown up and that's thrown up, gets thrown off. And that's kind of how we end up in stronger patterns. So this video is going to show how this gentleman's over afferentation of his teeth or his, uh, his stomatonathic musculature or how his bite is uh, stationed, how his jaw is positioned. He's overusing his stomatonathic system for something, for afferentation, for some reason, for probably stability. So I'm just gonna show you how we know this is occurring. So you'll see, and I'm watching it on my laptop as I do this, you'll see that I'm testing his adduction drop test and it does not go down, which means his hip flexors are at this point overactive. He is now going to put a tongue depressor between his teeth, right behind the canines, and I do the same test and his leg now goes down. So he can adduct, his hip flexor is turned off. Now he takes the tongue depressor out, taps his teeth together and watch what happens. He cannot adduct again, which means his hip flexor is turned on once again. So what was the process that occurred there? I've already seen this gentleman three or four times going back maybe three years. He's in medical school right now, so I don't get to see him much. What's occurring is for, he had, well, this is my guess that's what's occurring. We know his teeth are playing a role or his mandible, his jaw, his stomatonathic system is playing a role. His teeth look perfect. I don't, I don't see any issue with his teeth. However, he has an afferentation issue. He had a labral tear in his left hip many years ago, I think probably because of soccer. And I don't think it ever got rehabbed correctly. And over time, as that left hip became weaker and weaker and less and less stable, he had to find afferentation stability somewhere else. And I think at this point, he's found it through his stomatonathic system. It's not unheard of. So I just wanna make, I just wanna show this little diagram here about what we're talking about in the typical left AIC, right BC pattern. In the left AIC, right BC pattern, which corresponds with being on your right side, someone who has lateralized their body weight over to the right side. In that position, their right foot will turn out. It'll be more in a supinated position. So they'll feel their weight in two main areas. This is the vast majority of people will feel it like this. They'll feel their weight on the outside of their right foot and the inside of their left foot. And that corresponds with being on your right leg. Your left foot is down on the inside and your right foot is down on the outside because your weight has shifted to the side. So that's what you're seeing. 
So this typical left AIC, right BC pattern individual who laid down on my table, before his teeth got in the way, before he became so unstable that he had to use his, um, his stomatonathic system, and hopefully, hopefully you can see everything here, means that his brain is sensing, is getting all its sensory input of the ground underneath the outside of the right foot and the inside of the left foot, which corresponds with body weight being shifted to the right. Completely normal. But that means that his brain is no longer censoring, is censoring, is no longer, longer sensing input, sensory afferentation from the inside of the right foot and the outside of the left foot. That's why all PRI techniques have you sensing your left heel and your right arch, or the vast majority, because we have to re-afferentize, get that sensory input coming up th from the ground through your feet, those vibrations, those frequencies that go from the ground up through the appendages, through the spinal cord, and up to the, to, the, to the brainstem, where all this information is then integrated. At one point in his life, those vibrations, that sensory input was there. But because of injuries and tension and stress and all these other things, he lost that afferentation. Now your brain says, whoa, where did that afferentation go? It lost afferentation from the inside of the right foot and the outside of the left foot. Now you start to over rely on one area of, of, instead of having a broad range of afferentation, now you have a more limited range of afferentation and that becomes habitualized and patterned and that's the left AIC, right BC pattern. So what happened further? Well, more likely as this left hip, no, notice I, hopefully you can see it, I erased it. His left hip became so unstable that he's never sensing compression through his left hip joint. His right hip, on the other hand, is probably becoming over afferentized because his weight is staying too far to the right. So his brain is sensing not only outside of his right foot, but also his right hip joint, his right femur and his right hip joint, his acetabulum, are being overly represented in his brain. This has slowly become a lateralized tendency. It is becoming a habit of over afferentation through the right side. What else is he probably over afferentizing? His right diaphragm, his left diaphragm is sinking, or is not sinking, is shrinking in its representation. It's not being used. Why? Because his weight is over on the right side. So he's overusing his right diaphragm. That is then going to work its way up into the right neck area. And I'm going to show diagrams of that. And eventually, if that right neck area becomes over afferentized, his brain's overusing the right neck for stability and, and rotation of the head and breathing, it can then travel up into his mandible and how his teeth are touching because of these very predictable muscles. And I'm gonna show you that next. Here is the first muscles that we're talking about, the temporalis muscle, which is on the set up side of the right head. Notice it is a mandibular elevator. So it's a muscle of mastication of chewing. That temporalis is a really strong, big muscle. And again, it attaches to the jaw and it brings your jaw up. The lateral pterygoids, they are responsible for pushing your jaw to the opposite direction when you're chewing, not during speech, but when you're chewing. Overactivity of the right side, let me show you. So just take a look at those and now look at how they integrate with the neck. Look at the right neck muscles, the right SCM. The right SCM attaches to the base of the temporal bone. The temporalis also attaches to the temporal bone and the pterygoid is attaching to the mandible. So the TMJ, tempomandibular joint, is all affected by these muscles. And that's the right TMCC pattern. If you're over on your right side for too long and you become too unstable through your left side and you're no longer sensing the ground underneath your left foot, so your left-sided afferentation has gone away, you are now over afferentating the right side there's, hype, there's going to be hyperactivity of the whole right side of your body and your brain then becomes habituated to it. It's becoming the habit. It's only feeling the vibrations and the muscle contractions and the breathing of the right diaphragm. So that your brain become, that becomes the norm. It becomes normalized. And now you drop off your left side and you become more right dominant. But those Muscles are really important because they will move jaws eventually. They will change your teeth eventually because once abnormal jaw position is established uh, to one side or the other, you'll start to see teeth get 
pushed out, and I'm gonna show you a picture right now. Let me quickly interject. If you like this video, could you please like it, share it, or subscribe to the channel? This information is a culmination of 27 seminars, nine years of experience, and all everything I'm talking about in here, I've experienced, every single thing. So this is, a lot goes into this. So again, I'd, like, I'd appreciate it if you could like it, share it, or subscribe to the channel, thanks. If you look at these two sets of teeth, they're showing the same thing. Unfortunately, I drew them at different times, or I put the arrows in at different times, so they're, they're kind of weird. But what you'll notice, if you look over at the right side of these people's teeth, the canines, I have it myself. This is because of the torsion. I've made videos about this. This is a cranial pattern. You'll see in the bottom picture, the, the young woman's uh, right canine on top has been rotated out, displaced. On the bottom, you can see his bottom left canine, uh, his bottom right canine is also displaced. That's creating, it may not be a crossbite uh, uh, classically in dentistry, but we know that both of them, well, I know, definitely know the top picture, the bottom picture, I haven't worked with her yet, but those are her teeth, I'm pretty sure. But you can see also the midline is shifted over. So on both of these people, their midlines are shifted over to the right side. That is this, it could be, I can't say that it definitely is because I haven't met them in person, but I've met plenty of them in person. These people are in different countries, but I've met plenty of these types, including on Friday. Yes, it was on Friday. And I'm gonna show you, he had the same testing as the video that I just showed you. The moment we put the tongue depressor between his teeth, he could adduct his left leg. The moment he let his teeth touch, he could no longer adduct and his, his hip flexors would turn on. So it was the same testing. And not only that, I had I was pushing his leg down. It wouldn't go. Then he put the tongue depressor between it as I'm actively pushing and then it went down. So he, he realizes there's, just, there's a distinct possibility that he has this same exact scenario going on. And if you look at his teeth, the midline is shifted to the right and he's got displacement of his right canines. So that is usually indicative of the torsion situation that we talk about. When a jaw is to the left, and if the midline was more to the left, quite often that's really not a big deal. Uh, that, that can be, that jaw can shift, if it's off, off, this is my left, if the jaw is off to the left, it can be uh, shifted back to the center just through normal PRI techniques. Not a really big deal. Uh, so that's really not a problem. But I just wanted to show you what, in this position, this right side overactivity is going to create major issues. And then, now, last picture I just want to show you, the masseter muscle, which is also a big muscle of mastication, is often is off is also part of this. But look at the, the front of the neck, how the hyoid bone and then the omohyoid muscle that goes from the hyoid bone to the shoulder blade, to the scapula. So jaws that are to the right, or any time that you have a you know, missing teeth crowding, anything that's creating over afferentation of teeth and that restricts jaw movement because you can't let go of that over afferentation, you're going to see a lot of shoulder issues and then any muscle that attaches to the, to the scapula, to the shoulder blade, like the upper traps, uh, again, the SCMs because it's the clavicle, any of these muscles can stay hyperactive and painful. And of course, the SCM and the upper trap are both innervated by cranial nerves. So those are sympathetic nervous system uh, muscles. Those are, once you have that neck ache, that neck pain, it's hard to get it to go away because that's part of the, the vagal system even. It, it's uh, highly intertwined with the vagal nerve. So your body's constantly in tension because of those muscles. And uh, those muscles, again, are pro quite problematic because they are innervated by cranial nerves rather than the spinal cord. Now, coming back to this diagram, I also had a recently had a client. I'm still, I still work with him. I worked with him online initially during COVID, but I saw him twice. The first time he came in, uh, same, same issue was going on. He could got, not get neutral unless, but okay, I'll get to it. He could not get neutral unless we put the tongue depressor between his teeth. And then if I took the tongue depressor away, he would lose his neutrality. Even during a, P, during a PRI technique, he would only feel his left hamstring if the tongue depressor was between his teeth. Although if you look at his teeth, they look fine. He does have two extra wisdom teeth on the right side, on the bottom and the top. The ones on the left side were, were removed. The ones on the right side are, are, are still there. So I wasn't sure whether 
because the two extra teeth were there, whether he was over afferentizing, not consciously, but his brainstem, over afferentizing the right side and prioritizing that right side because of those two extra teeth, but this was because this was the confounding issue. He also had very poor shoes. He had very minimalist shoes, and I made videos about this, which you should watch if you understand if you want to understand why minimal shoes are not great for patterned individuals. But he had bad shoes. So what I hypothesized and what I think probably is the case, as he lost ground sense because of his poor minimalist shoes and a lot of extension-based weightlifting, deadlifting, squatting types of things. Remember, the more you extend, the more your neck is gonna get overactive. The more your neck gets active, it pulls you forward and up and it ungrounds you. So because of his lifting and his poor sh choice of shoes, he was being ungrounded. He was losing sense of this ground. Now, if you're not sensing the ground, that's the vestibule, right? That's your, your brain thinks you're gonna fall. So what, is he, what do you have to do? You have to overstabilize, you have to through, you have to overstabilize up top. And I think he was overusing his right teeth as afferentation sense for orientation over to the right to remain stable so that he didn't fall because your brain, his brain was not sensing the ground. Once he got new shoes, he came back in the second time. He got a better pair of sneakers from the PRI shoe list and he was neutral. That was great. At least in his, he was mostly neutral. And then eventually he became completely neutral. So at that point, because he was now neutral with a better pair of shoes, I know that the teeth really weren't the issue. They were a temporary way of stabilization because his brain had lost sense of the ground and probably had lost sense of his left hip and his left diaphragm. So the shoes were enough to deafferentize the teeth so his neck relaxed, his body could then reground, and I think he's gonna be fine in that regard. He still might get the wisdom teeth taken out just so everything's even, but that's for him to decide. So what may you have to do? Well, in order to re in order to reground, sometimes people have become so over afferentized up top that they cannot ground themselves because their brain is prioritizing the, infra, the sensory input from up here. It's completely ignoring the, sen that, the senses that we're trying to get from the ground, even with new shoes. So what most people, if this is, situation is occurring, most people are overusing their stomatonathic system for that afferentation. So what you can do, and I'm gonna show you this, this picture, you'll notice there's a tongue depressor between my teeth and you just put it right behind the canines, right back there, and that takes your bite away. Quite often, like you saw in the video previously, that tongue depressor is enough to get the body to go completely neutral. At that point, you can try PRI techniques again. If you, f you don't have to bite down hard, you just hold it there. You, can do re you could retest the adduction drop test, shoulder internal rotation test. You could uh, retest uh, shoulder horizontal abduction. All those three tests are on this YouTube site, so you can go look into the testing and exercise playlist, they're there, you can retest. If those ranges of motion have improved or if you're now able to feel your muscles better than, than previously, it means you, you were able to deafferentize up here, took that away, took away the offending sensory input, and now your brain could actually, well, your body could relax, the hip flexors would turn off, your back would relax, and your neck would relax, so now you have better ranges of motion. But if you felt the, your muscles better during PRI techniques, it would mean that you were then able to then reground. The over afferentation from up top decreased, and now you're able to re-afferentize from the ground up, which is what we want. If you can't de-afferentize from the top, you won't be able to re-afferentize from the bottom. Hopefully that makes sense.